Okay. Hello. And also, welcome. It's great to uh, be back on stream and uh, continuing our Disco Elysium playthrough. If you're just joining us, which is a good chance that you are, this is um, uh, kind of still at the beginning of our little playthrough here. And what we're doing is we're kind of playing through it like mix of role play, mix of psychoanalysis. I'm Brady. I'm a therapist. Uh, and I'm going to be doing like different kinds of psychoanalysis on the characters and kind of linking that to uh, the game design and like how it represents mental health. This game is just in another league when it comes to that sort of thing so far. Like I already did a video kind of talking about the skill system and how it represents this like very fascinating way to perceive like motivation and psychological priority. Um, so yeah, we're we're like we're gonna get pretty deep with this. The last two playthroughs or last two um, streams. I'm sort of just been figuring out the game and and now that I've like had some time to collect some thoughts on it I'll I'll be talking a little bit more about the the characters and their dynamics and like I guess why my character specifically is showing a lot of avoidance and confrontation and like is uh not maybe making some of the best decisions I'm doing like a mix of my own headcanon role play like I'm not trying to play the game the best way, honestly. I'm just trying to make this a fun, <laughs> a fun playthrough, like just kind of doing wild shit. Um, we're not going to see every single part of the game or every dialogue tree, and that's okay, you know. Um, but uh, it has been great to get some recommendations for things that, like, I just straight out missed because of like. So far, my character has just fallen into like, he's just failing upwards, basically, like passing some of the early skill checks. Uh, some of the the comments on the last video were telling me that like missing or succeeding in some of these early skill checks has like made me skip over a lot of tutorials, <laughs> which makes sense because I kind of feel lost on some of the systems. Um, but that's okay. We're discovering it as we go. And I think that just makes for interesting um, playthrough dynamics. What I have been fascinated by is how well the game has responded to my like weird way of approaching this like it's completely fine that i skipped certain things it's completely fine that i don't know how to play it very well um it's not like i've not reached a roadblock where the game's like hey slow down friend we, i need to teach you this before you move on and it's happy to just let me move on and try to fail my way through everything which is kind of life isn't it so with that said that's kind of where we are uh let's get started and continue our playthrough. Okay, so I'm just gonna recap for myself because I'm gonna be honest. I uh, I was I was very confronted by my last interaction with this um, madam on the boat. What I understand is that we're we're trying to do right now is get the information she has about the hanging, and to do so, she has basically convinced us that we need to stop drugs from moving into her port. Wonderful boat lady, yeah. Okay, let me give you a little bit of insight into like why I'm making certain decisions like this and uh, what I think about some of the character dynamics so far. I'm just gonna find my way back to the center here. Let's, uh, let's go in here. A nice quiet place to talk. Okay. So, some of the dialogue choices that I've made have come from a place where I'm trying to get into the mind of my character who is basically like what I imagine to be very insecure about his lack of memory, right? He's meeting a lot of strong personalities. He meets Kim very early on who has these very strong convictions. He meets the girl on the boat who is like a professional and sticks to her script very well. Like we were not able to get her to flex very much on what she was willing to tell us. We met Kuno and Kuno S, two characters who like, whether we like it or not, are very passionate in their um, way of communicating and representing themselves. And so 
in my head canon, like my character has met a lot of strong personalities and that's something that he currently doesn't have, right? And so it's sort of like compensation, right? We're trying to present ourselves as like the detective that we can like hope people assume we are, not the detective that we know we are. We lost our fucking badge. We don't have a gun. We, we look like a fucking goofball with our coat and our gloves and our crowbar. And, and we're just like failing our way through every successful encounter. Um, and so that's kind of like where the dialogue is coming from so far. It's kind of hard to tell what you really think in the moment. Yeah. So. What I want to do is uh, get a look at this thought cabinet. So this is something I hadn't actually looked at yet. How do I like this background music? It's uh, very, very calming and relaxing. Okay, so what am I looking at here? This is like... There's only one thing in here that I can click on, it seems. Temporary research bonus. Plus one empathy towards Kim Kitsuragi. Here's the thing about me and Kim. Okay, we're on kind of rocky terms. He and I. He, uh... He's a complicated character to me because... Every single other person who I've met has been immediately confrontational of me, right? They've immediately been, like, able to identify that I'm kind of a fraud. But Kim is this person who, like, immediately gave me his trust and started giving me responsibilities, which I find very suspicious as a traumatized uh, addict. Kim's a professional. You're a bumbling, semi-competent druggie. <laughs> Well, here's the thing, right? And this this is like, this is human nature, human psychology, and it's something that I experience in my practice, right? Um, in like a, the addiction space, is that people who have lots of trauma and who maybe come from like abusive homes or sorts of things like that, they naturally have a lot of trust issues. Like someone coming up to them and immediately telling them, I'm here to help you. I'm always going to have your back, right? Like that brings out uh, an immediate sense of distrust. And so what you will find people do kind of subconsciously is they will naturally push that person away, right? By being very vulgar, by being very confrontational, by sort of pushing and testing the limits. And what they're essentially doing, maybe without knowing, is they're trying to prove to themselves, let's say, you know, Kim walks into my life and he says, I always got your back and I don't trust him and I push him to his edge, and he abandons me. And I can go, see, that fits my worldview. That fits the trauma-informed worldview that everyone is always going to abandon me, right? Like, we naturally tend to do that. And so that's something that I experience all the time, right? Especially when I work with clients who are maybe court-ordered to be in treatment or something, who don't necessarily want to be in therapy. There is a kind of resistance that they express to, like, you know, why Why do you want to help me? What do you get out of this, right? Um, and you kind of just have to push through that. When you actually push through and show that person, it doesn't matter how vulgar you are. It doesn't matter how much you push me away. It doesn't matter how much resistance you give me. It doesn't matter if you tell me every single day that I'm a piece of shit and you think I'm exploiting you, right? If you stick with that person and continue to show them what we call uncond unconditional positive regard, they start to see that, like, okay, there is actually a way for me to trust someone. Like, I don't have to be so guarded because even though I can, you know, be a bit of a pain sometimes, this person's not going to abandon me. And then you've established a kind of rapport with them, right? And so that's kind of how I imagine the detective to be. Like, I don't know his backstory yet, but it seems like he doesn't have a lot of people in his life. It doesn't sound like he's got a very structured support system, right? So like, it's natural for him to be mistrusting, suspicious, avoidant, and resistant to new relationships, okay? So 
this is actually how like real psychology would position these two characters. It would not be natural for me to just immediately be like, Kim is my best friend because he says he's got my back. No, like it's much more natural for someone traumatized to actually push that person away over and over and over again until that resistance fades away and we establish that kind of rapport. Or maybe he is just a really cool dude. I mean, could just be that too. This clears up a lot how you're interacting with Kim in this playthrough. Well, exactly, right? Like, that's the way that I am interpreting my interactions with him, you know? Where I'm like, okay, Kim, you're going to tell me that I'm responsible in this uh, exchange with the lady on the boat, right? And then you're going to take away that responsibility? See, I knew it. No one trusts my capability. That's the that's the psychological mind, like, that I'm working with here, right? It's not natural for me to believe that someone would trust me. Yeah, it's a bit of role-playing. <laughs> my spirit, the core uh, part, t immediately told me he has my back. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's true, right? Um, yeah, I mean, like, a real-world experience. So, like, it was one of my first days at a new job once. And, and I walk into a, a group room, you know, I'm about to like do my first round of group therapy with a bunch of people who, you know, maybe come from Department of Corrections, who have criminal histories, who are struggling with addiction. Like um, they're, they're the kind of person that I'm talking about who, you know, they, they present a hard exterior, but there's a lot of psychological fragility there. And they are naturally going to like push back against anyone who walks into their life, especially like someone who looks like me, right? And and like is going to be very distrusting that I have good intentions or that I'm earnest or that I even know what the fuck I'm talking about, right? And uh, I started telling them a little bit about myself and um, I was telling them that like I, you know, studied overseas and that sort of thing. And someone had kind of said to me like, oh, do they wear those like uh, high water pant leggings over there too because i was wearing pants and like the the leggings were not all the way to my feet like you could see some of my shin or not my shin but like my ankle and i could tell that they were trying to do this they were like trying to see what my reaction would be making fun of me in a group setting and all of the other people in the room laughed and i have two choices here right like i can like try to be defensive and lose my chance at making rapport or I can sort of like show them that it doesn't matter how hard you push me, you know, I'm still gonna like be here to help you. So I told him, no, uh, they don't they don't wear these over there. That's just me. I'm still growing into these. And I got a laugh out of that. And like from then on, I never once got any of these people trying to challenge me like the same way. They kind of realized like, okay this is a safe person to push the boundaries with and pushing the boundaries is not going to turn them away, right? And I haven't gotten that moment yet from Kim. I, I'm still a little suspicious of him. I'm still a little bit uh, hurt and fragile and, and I'm not sure that he's gonna stick with me. In fact, there was a line of dialogue. Is there a way to like see past dialogue? Is there like a dialogue uh, record or something like that? I don't know if there is, but there was a line of dialogue in the last exchange with the lady on the boat that said like, there is a limit to the amount that Kim is willing to let your impulsiveness like derail this investigation. And I, I don't remember what part of my uh, psyche, my skill system was informing of me of this, but that is the exact l layer of suspicion that I'm talking about, right? Where I'm pushing his buttons, I'm really testing the waters with how much I can truly be myself and still be accepted. And there's a part of me that wonders, is he really with me because he trusts me and he's actually there for me? Or am I a means to his own personal ends, right? Like, 
as as Brady the player, I'm not like really that I don't have a personal bias against him, but as the character, I can see that expressed, this inner resistance to people who on the surface seem very trusting. Apparently you need to get racist to get a reaction out of him. Might have been empathy, yeah. But you see where I'm coming from, right? This is something that I experience a lot in my work, and I, I feel like it's coming through with our lead detective here. So, let's look at this thing. The thought cabinet. It looks like I only have one thing that I can really do in here. Um... The Insulin Civil War was not the first war to see the use of aerostatic aircraft on both sides, but it was the longest. For eight years, folded multi-rotor aircrafts crisscrossing the air above Revishal and the Arcade Islands. They made sweeps over sandy beaches and shot each other out of the blue sky, then sank as wrecks to the bottom of the sea. The Aces High was a custom on the revolutionary side, performed by squadron mates after landing. Lieutenant Kitsuragi likes it. Why is that? That's the problem. So what we can do here is, I guess, internalize. This thought. And what does that do? It gives us it gives us empathy. Oh, you spend time thinking on them. Okay, so this just happens passively, I guess. Let me get another look at that. For eight years. Hmm. Why does Kitsuragi like this? Perhaps this story or this narrative represents something he identifies with. Keep my eyes peeled for that. Let's see what she's got to say. Hello, sweetie. Immediately distrusting. I'm immediately distrusting. Wait, who's sweetie? <laughs> yeah, who the fuck is sweetie? You talking to me? Why, you are, officer. I'm no sweetie. Look at me. See the self-deprecation? See the immediate lack of trust? Like, this is as much a lowered self-esteem thing as it is, like, an inability to integrate positive feedback from other people because we always think there's a secondary motive. You're a handsome man, officer, with your mustache and your chiseled jaw and that silly dimple on your chin. Dimple or not, I'm a bitter man. The years have taken their toll. That simple dimple has only brought me suffering. Oh, I want to know what the story there is. Love can be cruel, sweetie. Love can be cruel. I don't like that she's interpreting my life story. <laughs> you mean this grandma on a wheelchair has ulterior motives? Absolutely, she does. You I can tell. Forgive me. I'm getting so scatterbrained. I completely forgot to introduce myself. So I'll let her introduce herself, and then I want to tell you something else about how, like, first impressions work psychologically and, and why. I don't have trust. Okay, maybe I do have a couple of trust issues. But I'm speaking from the point of view of the character here. I'm Lena. My husband, Morel, and I are staying with our friend Gary just down the street. But I come here for tea when they're away. Okay. This Lena is wacky enough for the Motley crew. Hire, Hire her on the spot. Okay, I like that idea. <laughs> hey, Old Winter King. Thank you so much for the sub, my friend. Enjoy your uh, early access to uh, these streams and uh, all other content that comes to the channel. You seem to be in a chair. How'd you like to roll with me? <laughs> yes, dear. Uh, I'm a paraplegic. Hmm. What is a paraplegic? 
I was also informed by um, many commenters that like there's no drawback in just continuing to explore dialogues. So I will be doing that because I guess it raises my chances of clearing some of these like crazy checks. It means I can use my legs. I was in an accident some years back, injured in the line of duty, as they say. Were you a mountaineer? Nothing so glamorous, dear. Though when I was young, I dreamt of planting the Revacholian flag on some figurative peak. Oh, they can hurt my chances too. Well, that's <laughs> we we'll just have to figure out how that goes. What did you I do was then? A training and development manager at a rapidly expanding mail order shoe company. Hmm. Okay. You'd think it would be a safe job, but I had to be everywhere. And well, once I happened to be under some faulty scaffolding. So it was an accident. I was lucky. This was almost 20 years ago, and I was compensated exceptionally well. One can only dream of such payoffs nowadays. Could I become a paraplegic? I hope not. Although the work you are doing for all of us is quite dangerous. Here's another thing. Yeah, she's admiring me a lot. Towering over her in your insignia, you make her feel safe. Okay. Maybe this, maybe this uh, paraplegic uh, getup is just a way to disarm me. See, authority speaks to me. Okay. As as the character, as the character, it speaks to. It's one of my competing mental states that. Most of the time, demands like immediate action. <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't be so bad hanging out in a chair playing pinball. Maybe I'm trying to avoid my responsibilities with that. I know, but that's what I'm saying. It's it's disarming me by making it, making me seem like. You know, she's not a threat to me. She's not a threat to me physically, but she could be emotionally. I'm not sure I should be in this line of work. That seems pretty earnest. You're a man at the peak of your physical and intellectual powers. You'll find another calling yet. I'm certain of it. Okay. Doesn't that mean authority's not speaking to you? Uh, yeah, maybe so. I don't know. Okay, thanks for clearing that no up for problem. me. There is no bitterness in her voice. She accepted the curiosity her condition inspires a long time ago. Okay, I have just demonstrated exactly what I talked about, which is... I wasn't sure if I could trust her. And so I pushed her boundaries, right? I, I asked myself, is she a safe person? What if I call out something that... I think would make her uncomfortable, right? Like her condition. And I make some weird remarks about that. And she continues to be earnest and admiring me. And my sense of empathy has come out to say, okay, you make her feel safe. That was authority. And empathy is like disarming me from perceiving her as a threat. Like the game just demonstrated exactly what I was talking about. Like basically perfectly. This game is so fucking good. Like, what the fuck? Okay, now I'm in. Let's go. What do you mean? Roll with me. I want you to be in my wheelchair partner fight in fighting crime, helping people catching sequence killers. <laughs> Roll out some cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, phenomenal cohesion between you and the game. That's what's like blowing my mind is like, it seems like every thought I have, the game is giving me like a, a very prompt reaction or demonstration of that. I think she could roll us a couple sigs, but I'm gonna. Now I'm trying to establish that rapport with her, right? The danger in what I talked about, where you push someone's boundary and, like, you establish that they are a safe person after all, once you confront them and they stick with you, is now there's a danger of me having a, like, overly attached perspective of them. Cause I'm like, oh, well, I just found the one person in my life who has not pushed me away or, you know, abandoned me once I, uh, like, pushed on them. 
now I'm gonna attach to myself to them forever, right? Like, and that's that's the other side of like uh, you know, abandonment and trust issues is uh, we develop codependency. Sequence killers, oh my. But I think you already have a partner, sweetie. What, this, this fucking guy? Kim has not shown me yet that he's going to stick with me. A partner who needs you to get back to helping the people of Martinez. See, don't, like, that's what I'm talking about, okay? Here, I'm trying to make a very important connection, Kim, okay? Like, this is, like, one of the only people who has not, like, immediately given me suspicion. Even the little girl in front of her little book stand with her cursed house set me on edge, okay? She wanted something from me. She asked me to go in the store. She wanted me to buy things, right? Everyone is out to exploit the detective, except this perfect... Uh, uh, lady here who, who has not given me any reason to doubt her admiration for me. And here I have Kim wanting to cut short that reaction because we've got bigger things to do. I've got problems with Kim, okay? He's, he's, he's getting in the way of me and my healing here. I know, I know, but there are side mysteries. Sequence killers into the paranatural. Maybe I should be a little sarcastic. Again, I'm trying to push Kim. I'm trying to get to that moment where he shows me that no matter how difficult I am, he stays with me. Yes, and it seems to me that you do well to stick close to him. He has the look of an upstanding officer of the law, someone you can lean on. And, sweetie, you are looking unsteady. <sighs> the way she calls me sweetie... I wish she was my mom. And even if he weren't there, I don't think you'd have much use for me. Why? Three heads are better than two. Please come along. But Martinez isn't the most wheelchair accessible place you see. I'd slow you down. Perhaps another time. See how much I'm opening up to her now that like I consider her a safe person? I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't know where I am or what I'm doing or anything. Like, that's one of the most honest things that my character has come up with to say so far. Yes, officer. You look rather dazed. Like a stunned fox. But surely things can't be that bad. I'm now being perceived. She won't judge you, no matter what you say. This game reads my fucking mind, dude. <laughs> <laughs> there is a there is a kind of uh safety, comfort and anxiety in the way that she perceives me. Safety because I can tell that she can see through my rugged exterior that is desperate to convince you that I am competent and healthy when I'm not. But also a kind of anxiety which is someone from the outside is looking in and showing me that my sense of security, of self and health is a facade even to myself, right? And now I trust this woman and she's like, hey, you don't look so good. And I'm starting to think maybe she's right. I drank so hard I forgot literally everything. Oh my. You know where we are, right? We're in Revishaw. That's right. In a hostel called the Whirling in Rags, to be precise. Hmm. Okay. Honestly, I don't know diddly squat about Revishal. It's, I've learned some things about Revishal, but not from the right people so far. What I've learned is that there are no schools in Revishal, okay? And the kids have nothing to do but hang around and insult adults all day long. <laughs> and that this place is full of racists and sad poetry boys like tommy i want to know what grandma thinks about this how would i even begin to tell you revishol is the most beautiful city in the world we're fortunate to be here you uh, what a fucking light in the darkness her perspective i am clinging to it now do you see how rapidly i'm getting attached to her now that i've considered her safe i haven't seen very many other cities personally but everyone says so Revishol is a rare jewel. This city used to rule the world, though it has seen better days. It's fascinating that she says this because every other character has pointed as at Revishol as like a place 
where things are dying. Even the ones who are optimistic, like Kim, he, he sees like a cultural value to this place, but he still feels like it's dying. Like it's losing its cultural value because of people like the racist lorry driver. Like everyone sees Revishal in a state of decline, except this woman. Speaking of history, you know what year it is, yes? It's a bad year in my late 40s or 50s. I don't even know how old I am. Let's go with that. There, there. The year is 51 and spring has only just started. I'm sure there are better days ahead. Are you saying the MC is just overthinking and afraid of negative things? But the lady shows that the negativity is a false alarm, specifically for her. No, I think that my character's perspective is that I can trust this lady and I trust her optimism. But... I can't live in the world that she perceives, right? Not the way I am. Like, she she has been able to make peace with her trauma. The way that she talked about, like, you know, I am a paraplegic now, and the fact that she has, like, endured that experience and remains optimistic, that is something attractive to my character as, like, insight. Like, Potentially, there is a way for me to be okay with myself, even though I am extremely flawed and I'm broken in a way that I will never get better, right? That's kind of why I imagine he asks, like, can I be a parap paraplegic? It's kind of a comedy line, but there's a little bit of, like, can I be like you? Like, would being a paraplegic make me feel better because I would I would find the kind of peace in my trauma and disability that you have. Like this game is so good. The the di like a single line of dialogue like that tells me so much from a therapeutic point of view. I want to be like her because she's found a way to make peace with this. And it doesn't matter that she is unfixable. She still feels okay with who she is. The lieutenant studies you rubbing his chin. Yeah, what do you see, Kim? I'm beginning to suspect that you might indeed be completely adrift in this reality, thinks the lieutenant. How can it be that bad? Never mind. We're in this now. See, he's sizing me up as well. I imagine that Kim is experiencing a very similar thing as our detective, right? He's wondering, like, in a similar way, this person is very chaotic. What what will happen if I test their limits? Will they stick with me, right? The, the, the lieutenant doesn't seem to have a lot of people in his life either. Outside, the melting snow seeps into the cracks in the walls and the cobblestone streets, all the way down into the sewers. Above ground, the first Maybells blossom. You can feel it, a great cold. Then the shiver passes. Whoever told me to spec into shivers was a uh, genius. I love this perspective. I can tell that this is taxing for you, so I'll just ask one more question. What regime are we living under? What mode of government? Definitely not a democracy. I'd like to think that it's the dictatorship of the proletariat, but something tells me it's not. Fierce warriors. Mm. Governed by intelligent machines that perform calculations to determine the freest market. Radios are being used to control people's minds. Cop. We're living under the cop regime. <laughs> um, let's, let's get her opinion. This is the only one that is not a statement. It's a question. So uh, maybe if I say it, she'll enlighten me. Nope. Sadly not. Revishal is what's called a zone of control. I knew it. Under an alliance of foreign powers called the Coalition. We have no government of our own, and what democracy we have is market-driven. If there's no government, how come there are cops? I don't even know what to say. I'm so disappointed. Hmm. Uh, let's see. What should I go with? Oh dear, this is troubling. 
You really ought to know that, being one yourself. There aren't any cops in Rivershoal, not in the traditional sense. The status of law enforcement has been a complicated matter since the revolution. Okay. She's giving me good good context here. This, this lady is like informing me of things that no one else would. And I finally feel safe enough with a person to let them know that I am completely ignorant of these things. Like, I couldn't tell the fucking boat lady that I don't know why I have a job. But we should stop for today, sweetie. You look like you need a break. She sees me! I'm not the best person to explain the big things to anyone. Look how honest and humble she is. And she sees me. She can tell how fatigued and sad I am. She's scared now. She's realized you really are brain damaged. <laughs> So how did I do? You didn't do too well, dear. It does look like you're having trouble remembering things. History and places. Remembering reality, in a word. It's very odd. Hmm. A sigh. The lieutenant buries his nose in his notebook. See, there's another thing that, that I'm not sure about Kim. The way that she spoke to me just now, she's, she's giving an honest reflection... And and she's empathizing with me, whereas Kim is showing me disappointment, and he's showing me mistrust. Like maybe I am too brain damaged to be useful to him. But maybe a fresh set of eyes is what the world needs. And while I'm no doctor, such bouts of amnesia are often temporary. So I, I wouldn't worry too much. Solid positive reframing there, Lena. Oh my god, her name is Lena? I just realized that. Wait! Wait a second, this is some Inland Empire shit. Of course, I am immediately magnetized to the character named Lena. <laughs> There's no way. This is eerie. This game is eerily deep in my psyche. You mentioned that three times. I didn't see that comment. For those who have no idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> my favorite uh, anime of all time is 86, and I am obsessed with the main character, Lena. Um, she's one of the most well-written characters I've ever seen, and I have spent many, many hours talking about like the psychology of her um, character and why she's so relatable and like here i find myself gravitating to another lena in a completely different medium this is weird <laughs> she means this sincerely worrying won't do you any good what is this uh, revolution you mentioned i'm afraid the people of this archipelago tried to build something new something different the rest of the world didn't like it so they came and ended it this was 42 years ago. But I'm a cop. Whatever it was hasn't stopped of me. Of course, sweetie. I, I really don't know how to explain it better. I'm just the poor woman, she thinks. What do I know of these things? And how can I help you? Lena, you have helped me more than you could ever know. And I only wish the game gave me a way to tell her that. That that she's she's someone so far who has finally given me some secure grounding in this lost world someone more educated in sweeping matters maybe you should ask oh yeah you want me to ask him no i'm not an encyclopedia i won't be a guide either i'm a detective okay setting up clear boundaries with me i can respect that but it doesn't bring us any closer kim of course then i don't know someone rich maybe Wealthy people are educated, though I don't know where you would find a wealthy person in Martinez. I've got to get going now. I'll come back for you, Lena. Of course, dear. Good luck with your case. I'm going to cry, dude. <laughs> Lena's the best. Do you think the MC should worry more, or do you think the MC shouldn't worry too much, like Lena said? I will talk about that later. I want to talk about how my character is experiencing anxiety. Like some of the dialogue choices that he is making 
not just me as a as the player but some of the dialogue choices it presents to me i sense a lot of anxiety in what he's saying and i want to talk about how anxiety works and what the behavioral response is um i kind of rushed out of here earlier so i kind of want to see if there's anything else this guy has to say. real mature man what exactly were you trying to accomplish you do understand you still owe me money, right? Oh shit, I hope I haven't consigned myself to paying him. Damn, your feet thought we got away. Oh fuck. So I So I I I got away with it and now I have stumbled my way back into just having to pay it anyways. That doesn't seem fair. You demonstrated some serious skills there. Slipping yes. away Sambo style. Yes. Exactly. By the way, Sambo, or Samarin Boxing, is an eloquently violent set of one-on-one -on -one fighting moves originated from the Samarin Isola. Sambo used to incorporate a wide array of martial disciplines, from archery to mounted combat, but mainly means aesthetically pleasing single combat nowadays. Sambo's style implies stealth, cleverness, and cool. I like the sound of that. I want to be cool. I want to be very cool. Maybe I can lean into the whole I'm brain damaged thing. What are you, brain damaged? <laughs> what the fuck? This is so weird. This is so fucking weird. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> How is this happening? Okay, um... No, I'm just getting my bearing. See how my responses, uh, <laughs> like, are different compared to these people? I'm trying to show um, confidence here. Money is what grown-up people use to pay for things. Things like this hostel room, or, or eight bottles of potent blend, and nine packs of Royal Extra. We use it for everything, really. Where can I get money? Are you serious? From your work? I don't know. You can take bribes, I guess. I'm sorry. I, I I'm not above bribes. Cops take bribes. I'm actually not above it. Take recompense, but only to survive. Why do I need it? For survival, to pay me. Unless you want to become a hobo. <laughs> do you want to become a hobo? There's nowhere else to stay in Martinez, and it's a cold spring outside. Money doesn't make you happy. But it lets you be unhappy for a bit longer. Holy shit. This guy's got wisdom. If you run out of money, you die. It's like that for all of us. Me too. That's why I need you to pay me. I'm not an asshole. I don't think I have any There's money. There's a shuffle of nylon as Lieutenant Kitsuragi looks for something in the pockets of his orange bomber. That's cop four. I haven't offered to pay because I don't have any money either. Mm. I'm sorry. I know it was irresponsible for me to run. You have to understand. I was desperate. Okay. So having the capacity to apologize is, is not an easily adopted trait. I'm going to have to pursue that one. You know what? The stupid drinks you've had are on the house. You know why? Because I know you can't pay for them. Not because you ran away. Can't you see I'm struggling out here? Now, I still have to charge you for three nights and the broken window. That's a hundred square. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> uh, so we're cool? Not entirely cool. You still owe me a hundred real. If you don't have it by tonight, I can't let you back up there. Oh, I now, can't come what back. What did you want? I assume you wanted something to come back here. <sighs> Is the trash container out back yours? Oh, I wanted to get inside that um, trash container. Mine? No, it belongs to the whirling in rags. Thank you for clearing that up. Why do you keep the container locked? Why? To keep the hobos and drunks out. That's why. And the neighbors, too. They put their trash there, and they don't pay for the garbage company. Wait, why are you guys surprised? What? You didn't know you could do what? 
It's so funny. I seem to be making like all of the weirdest decisions. I thought as much. And are you the only party with access to the trash container? Well, yes. Us and the garbage disposal company. Ah, oh, the garbage disposal company. See, that's the thing. You gotta, you gotta ask yourself who benefits. It seems a little callous, doesn't it? Something stirs in you. I wonder what this feeling is. No, it doesn't. Nothing stirs in me and it isn't callous. It's common sense. I did stick a point in rhetoric, sort of desperately hoping it would intrusively give me some insight. So I'm going to pursue this. Prod at him and find out. Ah, yes. Doesn't it seem callous to you, guarding even your leftovers from the poor? Callous? What are you, Kras Mazov? Almost all establishments in Revishol keep their trash locked. The whirling in rags is not special in that regard. We need we those need keys. It concerns the keys. Please cooperate. Just bring them back once you're done, please. Look at that. Look how, look how, look how far an apology goes to you. I've seen something here at the Whirling, Gart. I, I think I need to talk about. What thing? The mess yes, hall is reserved for the, the whole union. Damn union. Thank God. Just the nastiest and loudest faction. They come here in the evenings. Dumb, unruly types. Think they're big shit. But they're good customers. They place big orders and always pay on time. He hates the Union, but grudgingly recognizes its power over him. So he's directing his frustration at you instead. Retaliate. I love that uh, authority pops up a lot for my character, which tells me that my guy's way of organizing relationships between people is all about power dynamics, right? In fact, we even saw that with um, Lena, the woman in the world chair, which is like when someone has had some sort of trauma where their sense of control has been taken away, potentially this is like, you know, uh, sexual abuse or maybe um, bullying or um, abandonment, right? Like any of these things that have left the person feeling like they did not have control over a situation. That's what they tend to organize relationships as later in life, but in a very sort of like unadjusted way. And so every time I have an interaction with other people, I'm looking for the power dynamic. I'm finding this woman in the wheelchair and I'm immediately like, yes, I have this power over relationship with her because I can stand and, you know, she uh, can't, right? Like I have a questionable power relationship with Kim. He sometimes gives me a false sense of authority, so telling me like, it's your case detective, like you need to do the line of questioning, but then he revokes it. And so this is like, I'm not sure where I stand with him. As I look at Gart and the union, like that's what my character is latching onto is like, um, what is the power dynamic here? Like he understands why Gart is in this position because he hates the union, but recognizes their power over him. And uh, he's also doing something called displacement, which is something that I, I kind of want to talk about really quick. I'll just briefly bring this up. Because it's relevant to what this character is saying right now. So I want you to look at this line. He hates the union, but begrudgingly recognizes its power over him. So he's directing his frustration at you instead. Okay. So... When someone is directing something at you instead, right? What he's talking about there is a uh, kind of like a cognitive distortion called displacement. This is what we would call it. 
So displacement is the idea that we tend to have an emotion which has a target. Like for example, if my boss is telling me I'm, you know, not a good worker and I don't do my job well and I am easily replaceable, right? And like the emotions that I'm having are ones of anger or frustration or um, you know, like uh, resentment, right? But this is not a safe target for this emotion because there's all kinds of consequences if I act on this anger, right? Meaning that like, if I yell at my boss and I get in a fight with him, I could lose my job and I could lose my livelihood, right? Like there's a lot of uh, anxiety that interferes here right, kind of subconsciously. So this is not a safe target. And so the anger does not just go away, though. What happens is it gets redirected, it gets displaced to a safer target, which is often the people closest to us, right? This is the classic, like, I got in trouble at work, so I go home and I yell at my partner or I yell at my kids, right? A lot of people who do not know how to resolve this emotion when they can't act on it, what they do is they just collect it and they store it and they deliver it somewhere else to someone that they are going to have less consequences dealing with, right? And that's exactly what he's talking about here when he says... He hates the union, so he's directing his frustration at you instead, right? I'm the safe target because he can't he can't retaliate against the union itself. He'll lose his own livelihood. He'll lose his own power and status, right? And the way that I have kind of described this to people is um, I guess the way I'll say this is like how you are supposed to deal with this in the aftermath. Like, let's say I come home and I yell at my partner, right? The way you apologize to this is you tell them, you know, I'm sorry. I gave you an emotion that didn't belong to you. And that wasn't fair, right? I I collected this anger from my workplace and from my coworkers and from the people who wouldn't stand up for me and the fact that I don't have any money right now. And like that's a self-directed anger. Like I'm I'm directing this emotion in all these different places, and none of them are safe targets. But for me today, you are the safe target, and it wasn't fair to do that, right? Like I gave you this emotion and it didn't belong to you. And I just don't know how to deal with this yet, right? That's exactly what is happening here. That's what authority is telling me is what's happening here, right? Um, he's directing his frustration at you instead. It's asking me to retaliate. And I think the reason it's doing that is I also have a lot of collected trauma and anger and frustration, and I feel out of power dynamic balance with lots of people. And so he's he's the safe target for me right now, right? And earlier it was the doc lady. And earlier it was Kuno. Kuno happened to be my safe target to direct this displaced anger at the time. And so I tried to give it to him and it didn't work out, right? Like I'm walking around with this reservoir of emotion that I've collected and when I experience something that makes me mad and it really deserves maybe this much anger, but I get in touch with all of the anger that I have collected and not dealt with and I explode with it, right? This is like kind of the foundational way I tend to deal with like anger management is to understand where that anger comes from and why so much of it is being expressed when only this much really matches the situation that you're in, right? And so I think it would be displacement for me to retaliate here, just like it was displacement for me to retaliate against Kuno.
I've always conceptualized it as having energy that will come out, so you have to direct it towards something constructive. Well, that's true. The thing is, is we don't always choose something constructive. We choose something that's self-destructive. What you're talking about would be something called sublimation, which is when you deal with a um, displaced emotion in a socially acceptable way. For example, instead of like just handing this out to whoever makes me angry in the moment, what I do is I take up boxing and I get involved in an activity where I can start to let some of this out and it's a socially acceptable task, right? That's what we call a sublimation. And in some ways, I would probably say that um, being a detective is a form of sublimation for uh, Raphael because it's where he gets to act out in his socially acceptable way, his sense of authority. He's just not very good at it yet. It's the right outlet, but it's the wrong approach. Can we see his hands? I've covered up his hands. How does this knowledge of how does knowledge of this help a person who experiences it? Well, because you can start to recognize, okay, you know, I, I got in an argument today and I gave someone a lot of my anger and I can, you know, when you come to therapy and we might engage in that dialogue, like I might ask you, who was that emotion for? Well, it was for the person who cut me off in traffic, right? And it's like, okay, well, does the emotion of that event match realistically, right? I would work with them on understanding that, no, this is a disproportionate release of emotion for the situation. And then we would start asking, okay, who is the real target? A lot of times, it's not my boss who I can't safely target. It's it's my mom who has never been in my life, right? Like, it's it's a target that's not only maybe not safe, but not available. It could be society, right? It could be like, I'm really angry at the economic system, but how do I express my anger to the economic system? Well, it's not like I can directly go punch it in the face, but I might start developing very negative opinions about bankers and CEOs and people who in a sort of a symbolic way represent that institution that I'm very angry at. So how do you get rid of it? <laughs> you can't punch capitalism, yeah. Well, you need to find something that, that works for you in terms of this right here, right? We need to first understand that the anger or sometimes it's grief, sometimes it's sadness, like it, it's not just anger, but this is a very common one. Um, we need to understand that it is being displaced, why it is being displaced at this person, and then we can start figuring out what the outlet is, right? Because everyone's going to deal with um, feelings of anger in a different way. Like for me, I like to run, right? When I go to the treadmill or out on a run, like this exertion of energy and like the rush of endorphins it sort of like tempers the feelings that I have and kind of lets me like direct them into something productive for myself, right? Like it, it, it calms me down in a way. Um, talking about it, right? Uh, Sigmund Freud called the process of talking about something and the emotional release you get from it catharsis. He also called it the talking cure because just telling the narrative of what happened and learning and understanding like why it happened is something that in, in a lot of ways releases this reservoir for you in a lot of ways. Hey, Venzorkin, thank you so much for the sub, my friend. Enjoy your early access to things. And uh, Varsoon as well. I missed you earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yeah, displacement, right? I think that that's what we're going to see a lot of in this world because it's very natural ways to deal with our emotion. And in fact, sorry to keep <laughs> going back to the game and back to this, but you can imagine, like, let's say I'm in an exchange with my boss and I'm displacing that anger to, um, you know, my partner. 
And my partner, like, let's say they got in an argument with their friend and they're displacing that anger towards me, right? And essentially, like, I'm giving her emotion, she's giving me emotion, and neither of us are really the people that this belongs to, but we're the ones in an argument. It's so often how relationships start to break down is partners not collaborating on what they're feeling and bringing displaced emotions home and not knowing how to deal with them. It's something that comes up a lot when I do like couples counseling. I've heard that having an outlet like boxing to release anger is bad because it makes you become violent. Well, you have to know what you're doing and why to get the benefit of acting it out, right? It's about like knowing you're doing that with the intention of releasing it and that being violent isn't the outlet. It's uh, learning to control the emotion, right? It, like your perspective matters a lot. You did pet the mailbox, displaced affection. Yes. 100%, right? Good emotions can be displaced as well. We've seen a lot of people angry at things they can't control. Yeah, totally, right? That's how I understand Kuno. I talked about this like very briefly when I was actually doing the this uh, discussion about the skill system. That like my understanding of Kuno is probably that like there's a very good reason why he's the way he is. Like he probably has a lot of displaced emotions and a lot of missing sense of control and the way he gets that control backed is by getting a reaction out of people okay let's continue because i could talk about this stuff for a very long time um because we are self-aware about our displacement, I'm going to ask myself to let it go. Let it go. You're above gratuitous baiting. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. The game is unmuted. We should find out a lot. We don't. We have to wait. They'll show up sooner or later. Men get hungry, even striking men. If not today... Then they'll be here tomorrow. There's something else I want to ask about. By the way, you should come back to this thing-based questionnaire if you see anything interesting in the whirling later. Okay. By the way, I'm going to sing Absolutely karaoke here. Out of the question. Oh, it's quiet. I can raise the volume. You wait and see, cafeteria manager. Absolutely in the question. First we find a sad banger. Then we sing this place to shit. Another thing. Great. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I can uh, increase the volume a little bit. <clears throat> That should do it. Let me know if it's too loud By the now. Way, where is home? The address is coming up blank, and this place sure isn't it. Do I even but have one? Been at this hostel cafeteria for only three nights. Where were you before? You had to be somewhere. I don't know. Near south, maybe. You don't really know, do you? Does this mean I'm homeless? No, we must have been somewhere. A vague, blackened image doesn't sound like somewhere you can stay if you run out of money. That's a good point, Encyclopedia. I'll live in a dumpster, I don't care. Fuck everything, hobo cop. <laughs> you can Let's find try. out. Run some addresses in your head when you get the time. Maybe a street or an apartment will appear. Man, there's. I have so many lingering like things to do this is crazy okay so there's a couple other things in the thought cabinet now i i do want to talk about this but i think i need 
to be more acquainted with the system before I give like a real breakdown about how this represents mental health because I do have some thoughts on that, but I want to see what happens after I've internalized something. Thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, consider giving it a like and letting me know what you thought of it in the comments. You can subscribe to catch the next video here, or you can see things a bit earlier if you support the channel either through Twitch or Patreon. Links to both of those and the community Discord are in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Bye.